Okay, everyone. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about stochastic simulation and uh, discontinuities, that is discrete events. So I'm going to do this together with Jan Moraro, uh, and I'm going to start with stochastic simulation. So this is something that uh, Les Lowe already mentioned yesterday, but uh, I will still go through it in a little bit more detail and also do some examples and highlight some things that maybe you are aware or maybe you're not aware about stochastic simulation. So basically why we do it is the issue that, uh, there's a couple of issues. The first one is that um, if you go down to really looking at molecules, um, differential equations are not very appropriate because they will they are continuous functions and so they would uh, give you results as such as 2.3 molecules and really that cannot happen it's either two or three molecules it cannot be 2.3 um, so so ODEs have a problem uh, representing that so that's the first argument uh, the second argument is that uh, so obviously the reactions themselves are also not happening continuously uh, they happen in, in discreetly as molecules combine and form new molecules at a certain point in time. So that's still part of the first argument is the other side of the coin. The, the second argument is that there is also noise in this process. Things don't happen necessarily the same way. They happen with certain probabilities. And that's because there's Brownian motion of molecules and, and thing, molecules reactions only happen when molecules really collide. So... Together, the fact that ODs do not represent noise and also represent fractions of molecules means that when you zoom in and you have small numbers of molecules, when really it matters, uh, then ODs are not really appropriate to simulate these systems. So that's why we go to stochastic uh, simulation. Now, just to think, just to put you in context, let's think a little bit. Do some back of the envelope calculations, or maybe uh, on on a slide calculations about what concentrations and particle numbers are. Um, okay, so obviously to convert concentrations into particle numbers, we have to calculate a concentration is is essentially uh, the number of molecules per a certain volume. However, we don't express the number of molecules because it's a very large number uh, for, for at least for uh, macroscopic volumes. So we use this concept of uh, using Avogadro's number of molecules. So that's what we call a mole. So that's six times something times 10 to the 23 molecules. So one molar is that number per in one liter. Now, if you think uh, of a reasonable concentration of many uh, at least metabolites, think of a uh, micromolar. It's more typical than a molar in cells. And now consider the volume of an E. coli cell. Okay, so now we have 10 to the minus six molar and everything in a volume approximately 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15 of a liter. So let's calculate how many molecules exist in that, um, in that space at that concentration. And the calculation is 945 molecules. Well, that also means, so if you now think of one nanomolar, uh, which is a thousand times less than 10 to the minus six, um, it says here that there are only nine to 10 molecules, but it's uh, it's not true. There's only point, it, there's only basically one, either 0.9 or, or one molecule. So that is what, concentrations mean in small cells like like E. coli volume. Of course, in some eukaryotic cells are much larger, but still you have very small numbers. So it's not difficult for many substances to exist in very small numbers of molecules, which again is another um, motivation for, for uh, stochastic simulation. So how do we do stochastic simulation? So the first thing is to consider that rather than having rates of reactions, um, we have propensities for reactions to occur. And the propensities, you can think of it as a probability of a reaction happening at a certain time. It's not exactly, uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but that if you think of, of it that way, that's, that's uh, pro that you know, should be good enough for, for this level we're talking. So the rate of a constant rate reaction, which would be written such as the rate of reaction V is equal to a constant, if we do go to the stochastic world, then that says the propensity of that reaction is also a constant. 
Okay, that's fairly uh, easy to understand. Now, if we have a first order mass action reaction where certain substance A get transformed into a product P, uh, the rate of reaction in the ODE world is mass action. It's equal to a constant times the concentration of A, where in the stochastic world, the propensity of that reaction is equal to a constant times the number of molecules of A. If we have a dimer uh, reaction of two molecules, A plus B giving, um, doesn't matter if it's P or P plus Q, um, but A plus B to different substrate molecules, then mass action says that it's a second order rate constant times concentration of A times concentration of B. Well, the reaction propensity is similarly the a constant times the number of molecules of A times the number of molecules of B. So by, uh, up until here, they're formally the same. They look exactly the same, whether instead of concentrations, we're using molecule numbers. However, if you have a dimerization reaction, which is similar to the previous one, but now it's two molecules of A reacting and forming, well, a dimer, um, the rate of reaction in the ODE world would be written as constant times the square of the concentration of A. However, in the stochastic world, the rate, the propensity is equal to a constant. Well, it's C over two. You can consider that still to be a constant times the, constant, the total number of molecules of A multiplied by one minus the total number of molecules of A. And the reason for this is because when you draw one of the molecules out to react, if you're going to take another one, then there's one molecule less in the pool than now because you've chosen one of them already. So that's the difference here. Um, and the software like Copasi and Virtual Cell do this transformation automatically. They can detect when it is a dimerization reaction and they transform the kinetics appropriately. Now the difference, the the relationship between the constants and the and and the between the rate constants in the macroscopic world and the uh, constants in the propensities are are written here. So for first order they're exactly the same thing. For second order they again have to be divided by the uh, Vogadros number and the volume. For first for constant flux they have to be multiplied by that. And for dimerization uh, they still have this factor two over N A times V. So this is what software does automatically. You don't know this because in, in software like Copasi, for example, I'll show here, you can go in a time course straight from deterministic and pick a stochastic algorithm and the software automatically does this, all of these conversions. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a little bit the chemical master equation, but that's a basically uh, a differential equation that shows how the probabilities of states of a system evolve with time. That's uh, really would be the exact uh, description of the physical chemistry of, of all these molecules reacting. Um, we're gonna move into what Gillespie developed, which is why all, all, most of our stochastic simulation systems work, which is he defined a next reaction density function, which is this probability distribution function here, um, which gives us the probability that a certain reaction tau um, out of the possible reactions that we have indexed from tau being a number from one to m, m being the number of reactions that can possibly happen. And at a certain time tau, uh, that reaction will happen. Um, and so this is what governs the stochastic simulations and Gillespie developed actually two different algorithms. Um, whereas you can generate a sequence of random numbers that then dictate which reactions happen and when, when they happen. And that's exactly how the simulations are done. Essentially the software draws a random number first to figure out what at what time happens the next reaction. That's the tau, that's by how much the time course increases. And then another random number to find out what is the rea which reaction happens, which is then uh, taken um, as the as the propensity, well, using the propensities of the various um, reactions. 
So it determines when a reaction happens and which one. And so it then just, if it is A plus A giving P, then it just takes away two A's and it increases one P. And then it goes back to do the same, doing the same thing. Draws another time, that's another tau, and which other reaction happens. And that way, all the things progressed. So of course, as you can imagine, because the propensities are proportional to the numbers of molecules in the system, and Avogadro's number is in here, then um, we, if you have a lot of molecules, the tau's, the increase in time are going to be very, 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 very small, so small that we can no longer run those simulations. So when you have very large numbers, you cannot run this, and then you have to switch back to the ODs. Um, the other thing that you cannot have is reversible reactions, but that's not a real problem because you can break reversible reactions into two. Um, so if you have a reaction like this, A plus B giving P plus, P plus Q reversible, you can split it into two different reactions that each of them are irreversible. So that's not a problem. Again, software can do this automatically. In Copasi, we have an option to automatically um, convert uh, the reactions to irreversible, which is this option here under the menu, in the tools menu. And I believe in virtual cell, you, you also have uh, something similar. And then, um, right, we have, I've gone through that. Um, so I think I'm just going to show an example very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm going to show uh, the lotka volterra model, which you might remember as being a, a model of predator-prey interaction. So for example, rabbits reproducing and creating more rabbits and foxes eating the rabbits. And in when Lotka and Volterra describe that system, they use differential equations. So I have a model here of that, exactly what I mentioned, what's in the slide. Uh, rabbits reproduce for more rabbits, then foxes eat the rabbits, make more foxes, and the foxes can also die out. That's what um, Lotka and Volterra determined. And, and when they run this with ODEs, you get a nice um, oscillatory system. So you get these oscillations, whereas basically, if I do a little shorter time, where basically the rabbits start increasing and then eventually because there's so many rabbits, the foxes can eat more. And so the fox population starts increasing, but then at some point the rabbits go down. And so the foxes are starting to starve. So they reproduce slower and eventually they come down. But a little later, uh, the rabbits start increasing again. It's the same thing, right? So they keep going in this kind of oscillatory regime. However, let's imagine now that uh, this is stochastic, that we have probabilities of these things happening, of the rabbits and the foxes encountering each other and having uh, an event of foxes eating the rabbits, etc. So we just go and change the model to stochastic. And Copasi, we have two direct stochastic algorithms. Both of them are essentially the Gillespie algorithm. It's the direct method and Gibson and Brook. And I think in virtual cell, you have mostly just Gibson and Brook, but they are equivalent. They have some details that are different in the way which they work. But um, for small systems, the direct method is actually faster. For large systems with many reactions, the Gibson is probably faster, but the difference is small. Anyway, I'll choose one of them and I'm gonna run this stochastically. And what do I have? I have also still oscillations. However, as you can see, the peaks, the amount of rabbits that peak and foxes, it's no longer constant. Um, and then sometimes what happens is, what happened here was the foxes went extinct. And now the rabbits are just reproducing and going to close to infinity because there are no foxes. The rabbits don't die uh, in the Lotka Volterra model. They only die by being eaten. So if the foxes are extinct, the rabbits just go to, to very large numbers. I'm going to stop it because you know it's already at uh, 300, 400,000, 400 million uh, species. And eventually Copasi said, well, these numbers are too many. Um, so too many reactions happening. Uh, so we, we can stop here. But you can see what happened was the foxes went extinct. So let's run again. By the way, I'm not changing any parameters. This is just the the luck of the of the random numbers being drawn. Again, we have oscillations. And then again, we have another case where they go extinct. Then more oscillations, another extinction. There's one, one thing that can happen that I haven't shown yet. Now there's 
some oscillations and then they then they get extinct at some point in time not right at the beginning what we are not seeing is sometimes everybody dies because ah, here it is you had one oscillation another oscillation and now the foxes were too um too efficient they ate all the rabbits and now they're going to die themselves because they can only live with their rabbits so when you move from ODE to stochastic, you don't always get the average of the of the ODE, um, particularly if the numbers are small and if you have nonlinearities such as oscillations. Um, and that's why running a stochastic simulation is can be important. Um, these are the effects of the stochasticity are being reflected in macroscopic quantities here. So anyway, I'm going to stop here and uh, pass on to Jon Moraro, since we only have another 10 minutes, to talk about um, the discontinuities. However, maybe uh, I can propose one thing here, uh, Jon. We have a session in the afternoon, which um, would be 45 minutes, and I think that session doesn't need 45 minutes. Um, we could perhaps um, do the, okay, the so there. let's do discontinuities in the other session, and I'll just present the stochastics in in, in cell right now. Yeah, I think that's better. Okay, so I will stop yes. sharing, and you'll you'll share. Yeah, feel free. But like in ten minutes, we'll have an rated lecture. So. Exactly. That's why. I, that's why I want to do this. Okay. Okay, um, so um, in virtual cell, I have this uh, public model that we've been using in our introduction to systems biology graduate course over the years. Uh, again, the same idea that in a small volume with a fairly small number of molecules, the effects of noise uh, are important. And um, to explain first what the model is about, this is uh, a model of a uh, dual genetic regulatory mechanism where we have two proteins, A and R, that are being synthesized and the Protein A, short for activator, is actually acting as a promoter in the DNA. It binds to the DNA on both the promoter regions of um, A and of R and stimulates the synthesis of both. R, who stands for repressor, is a repressor not because it inhibits the synthesis, the synthesis of uh, either A or R, but it binds to A in the cytosol. And when this complex of A and R forms, then A can no longer act as activator. And this uh, mechanism where both are stimulated the same in the same way with the only difference that the actual rate of tran transcription for both of them is different, leads to a very interesting behavior where uh, it never reaches equilibrium because the synthesis of one always lags behind the other one and they keep inhibiting and activating and it leads to a uh, oscillating behavior. So, um, the model in virtual cell, I have it here open. Let me open it up. No, nope, that's the other one for the afternoon. Uh, what this one, um, why am I still seeing the same one? Yeah, no, it's this one. Has several applications. So first of all, the reaction diagram is simply the same idea of um, having a promoter that binds to the DNA and then 
post uh, D the DNA with and without promoter will produce mRNA at different rates, you know, obviously faster when the promoter site is occupied than when it's not occupied. And <clears throat> simply running deterministic simu simulations of this model uh, will very easily reproduce the figure in the paper. Um, and sometimes I get runtime errors on my laptop. So this is just ran it instantly right now where it shows that both A and C over time have an oscillatory behavior. And if you plot them, you'll see they're always lag one um, compared to the other. Now, what you can do, because this is a small cell that has only one cubic micron volume and you look at what is the copy number of the DNA binding region? Well, there's just one for each of them. So that's by definition, a low number of molecules, right? Even the number of copies of uh, the protein themselves are fairly small. So this is a situation where you would want to rerun this stochastically. And all you have to do is to just copy this as a stochastic application. And then you can simply rerun with one of the several different solvers, which you also have Gibson Brock or hybrid, same as, as Pedro mentioned. And if you run this stochastically, you will see that you essentially get very similar results, but with some effects of noise. Now, it becomes a little bit more interesting if you start looking at what is the effect of different parameters when you run it stochastically. So uh, let's say we can do a, a, a scan simulation where we try three different values of this particular parameter, which is the uh, rate of transcription of protein A. You rerun this. If you run it locally, you will get um, a question about how many simulations in the scan you should run at the same time. It depends how many cores you have on your CPU, but these all run very quickly. So it's perfectly fine to just say run them one at a time because it will just finish them immediately anyway, sequentially. And you will see how at different values you have different behaviors with more or less noise effect. Now, what about the volume? We can do the same thing and with the same parameter and scan for the cell size where let's say this is from the size of a bacterial cell to the size of uh, uh, you know, a, a larger, uh, almost a eukaryotic cell size. And let's see what happens. And again, we can run this stochastically and we see at the size of cell of one cubic micron, you get the oscillatory behavior, 10 cubic micron. Oscillations are not that robust anymore. At the high one, oscillations essentially disappear and it just stabilizes at the noisy steady state. So, The virtual cell, as you already know, can also do spatial simulation and you can actually run this on a geometry where it is an actual sphere and you set the DNA as non-diffusing in the center. And with exactly the same parameters, you can run that and I'm not going to run it locally. I'm just going to look at the saved results because it takes about five minutes to run with the PD solver. And uh, let's look at protein A, which obviously is being synthesized where uh, the DNA is located in the center and it has a gradient uh, of concentrations throughout the cell. And we can look over time at the point here we can do a time plot, which will take a few seconds to retrieve all the data. 
and you see the same oscillatory behavior even when diffusion is taken into account. And you can go one step further and do the stochastic simulation also in a 3D resolved geometry by using uh, Smalding as a, uh, as a solver, and which is as simple as copying the application to a new application. And we can look at the simulation results in a stochastic run, and you will see that there are certain instances where there's only two molecules situated wherever in the cell, or even no molecule present um, as they get degraded and resynthesized. And you can analyze all this data uh, in a little bit more complicated way, which we have no time to go through right now. But um, bottom line, you can run any, well, not any, but most models that conform to uh, <clears throat> normal kinetics with unidirectional, uh, every single uh, reaction is explicit. You can convert them to stochastic and you can run them deterministic ODE, deterministic stochastic, deterministic PDE or stochastic PDE. We, we have to finish, Jan. Yep, that's it. <laughs>